please welcome to the stage Lal Karsenbai, Executive President okay. of Emerson Automation Solutions. Okay, good, good morning. Well, just barely good morning. Good to see everybody again. Thank you for coming. Um, you should feel at ease. I'm not going to speak for very long. They didn't even mic me up this time. And Jane's got me on a clock. Uh, that's two minutes long, but I, I just wanted to take the opportunity uh, to say a few words. Um, we live in a very dynamic environment. We, we live in a very dynamic economic environment. And a lot of things are going on that impact our industry and our space. But we believe as an organization um, that creating this digital transformation business unit is very important, particularly at this point in time. We have a $650 million business today already in this space. It's, for those of you who've known Emerson, it's lived in three or four different places across our organization. And with the leadership of Stuart and the collaboration of Peter, we're gonna bring all that technology, all that selling capability, consultative cap capability together on the one place, on the one roof, that can really drive what we believe to a billion dollar business very quickly here. So I'm very excited. I'm going to leave the stage to, to Peter and to Stuart for the next few minutes. I want to thank Selenese and 3M. You'll hear from them uh, in a few minutes as well, who will join us here on stage and give us some of the customer perspectives and the journey that they're on and the impact that digital transformation is having uh, on their business. So thank you very much. And Stuart, welcome. Thanks, Slow. All right, well, I'd like to welcome you as well. Uh, to uh, both the media and also the industry analysts that we have joining us today. Um, thank you. We know that your time is uh, very busy. Uh, you have a lot, of, a lot of things going on, and so we really appreciate you spending time with us this week. We also know that you have a lot of influence in the, in the industry, and you can help to identify and bring attention to what are really the, the important topics. And when it comes to this topic of digital transformation, I think we'd all agree that there is so much buzz, so much hype, uh, so much conversation about technology and different aspects of it that it's incredibly difficult to figure out um, what's real, where should I get started, and we think that you have a very important voice in helping clarify that for customers and help bring that idea of a practical and pragmatic approach to this, to this whole topic. Um, I'm probably a new face for many of you uh, in the audience. I have been with Emerson for 30 years, as we talked about. Uh, my background, uh, until I took this role, as of today, I guess, officially, um, I, uh, I led strategic planning, global marketing, um, industry programs, and I've also been responsible for our own internal digital transformation for the last five years. So it's an area that I've lived in, if you will, in terms of trying to drive that transformation with our, within our own organization and driving the adoption of the technologies. So with that, I'd like to uh, start, though, with a brief safety moment. Um, and if you've figured your way around this building so far, you're in a pretty elite group. <laughs> and so for the rest of us, out of the doors, to your left, down the stairs, exit uh, two flights of stairs, exit, and then you'll see signs at that point to a mustering area, okay? Um, safety is very important for us. Uh, it's a key value at Emerson, and uh, we take this very seriously. These are our 12 life-saving uh, behaviors that we've shared with you in the past. All right, so we've got a great agenda for you this afternoon. Um, I'll kick things off, and I'll just do a short recap of some of the conversations that we've had over the past few years just to set today's conversation, which Peter Zonio is going to lead for us here around the topic of operational analytics. Then we'll have um, a couple of, of really excellent uh, customer presentations. Uh, Rob Sense from 3M and uh, Greg Aguilar from Selenese. And both of them will talk about their own digital transformation journeys, the strategies behind those, uh, how they're implementing programs, analytics, but also scaling them across their organizations. I think that's a critical point that we'll, we'll listen for in that presentation. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A with the customers and Peter will come back on stage. So if you have questions, which hopefully this will generate a lot of them, um, hold your questions till the end and we'll do uh, the Q&A all at the end of the session. So over the past several years, we've talked to you about Emerson being this partner with our customers, whether it's on projects or for operations. In 2015, we introduced Project Certainty, which was the combination of work processes and technologies to help customers eliminate cost, 
reduce complexity, and accommodate the change on capital projects. In 2016, we then introduced um, operational certainty, which again looked at the combination of technology and work processes to improve reliability, safety, production, energy, and emissions. For many years, the past three decades probably, our customers have invested in automation to automate the process side of their operations. And certainly for the first couple of decades, we saw dramatic improvements in productivity and performance as a result of that automation. But today, further automation of the process it itself may be resulting in still some incremental improvements, but maybe not the step change that companies are looking for as we move forward. And that's the opportunity that digital transformation represents. We see these five competencies being critically important, automating workflows, decision support, workforce upskilling, very, very important. We talked a lot already this morning, and you'll hear more as we go through today about the people side of this, and then change management. So let's just explore this a little bit further. Um, everybody in the room is very familiar with the idea of the, the closed loop on the process control side with sensors, the control, and then uh, a final control element. But when it comes to a lot of the other functions inside of the customer's operation, reliability, safety, and energy, today, much of that is run open loop, has much less automation. It's mostly manual data collection. We perhaps have a variety of fragmented applications, and sometimes that information isn't getting to the right people to drive the action. And really the opportunity is to bring more of this idea of the closed loop, more automation to those functions as well, and that's exactly what the plant web digital ecosystem is about. We continue to advance the plant web ecosystem, Sensors, secure communications, the platforms and software, and the consulting and implementation services. Today, um, in this uh, media event, we're going to spend a lot of time on the advancements that we've made recently in that platforms and software area, specifically in the area of analytics. We also introduced last year this, this journey for digital transformation and the idea of a, of a roadmap. Um, again, we've talked about this idea that there's a lot of technology associated with digital transformation, but it has to start with a clear business case and knowing what it is that you're trying to achieve. We have been using this roadmap approach for the past year as we've engaged with customers, and it's really proven to be a terrific vehicle for identifying where they are today, what the journey is that they want, and the results they want to achieve, and what's that stepwise way of getting there. So at the end of it, we really think of, of these three areas as being the critical success factors. First of all, focus on the business outcome that you're trying to achieve. Take a scalable approach. I think there is now um, overwhelming evidence that taking a big bang approach to digital transformation doesn't work, trying to bite it all off at once. So being more scalable, but guided by a vision so that the steps are towards something bigger over time. And then last but not least, Taking, a, taking care for the people investment side of this, because if, it isn't adopt, if the technology isn't adopted and we, we don't have that employee engagement, then we won't have successful transformation. So with that, I'm going to, hopefully that caught us all up a little bit on the past five years. Uh, I know many of the faces in this room have uh, lived on that journey with us, but uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Peter. Okay, great to see uh, so many familiar faces and a few new ones as well. Uh, at some point in time, I think the marketing people are going to make me change this picture. But for now, <laughs> for now, I like this because, you know, it's now I have less hair and more waistline. I like this picture, uh, you know, so well, let's freeze frame that a little bit as the digital twin that I'd like to remember, <laughs> okay, of, of once upon a time. So as Stuart said, what we'd like to talk to you today about is analytics in a more practical or what we think is the practical and pragmatic approach for how you go about analytics. And of course, analytics is a hot topic, if not the hot topic, when you pick up anything talking about digital transformation or go to conferences, and not just in our space, but really across any particular business application, right? Whether it's 
uh, being done at the enterprise level or on more of the operational analytics as we've talked about. Big numbers, also big numbers from uh, that we've seen as well as consultants have seen, like Gartner sees over four trillion available in manufacturing with analytics. A survey that we did recently in this area though showed that there's still a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. These were the top five questions that came back from that survey when we asked about analytics. You know, and you can read them there and they're pretty basic questions, some of them. Where do I start? Where can it be used? You know, what's the difference between OT and IT analytics? And you can see a, a not so, you know, maybe optimistic quote there on the, on the bottom from one of the end users where he was saying, hey, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of talk. We're not sure that the results have yet lived up to the potential in the talk. And there's an enormous number of companies that have gotten involved in this space. Uh, one of the folks we work with said they counted 900 potential companies that were in the analytics space. Uh, you can see just kind of a sampling here. But a lot of those are people that are doing analytics for a whole variety of different types of applications. If we look at this and look at where we live, you know, in the OT, in the operations area, there's quite a few less companies that are actually, although a lot, that are strongly focused on production, operations, plant level kind of benefits. Now, if you're a manufacturer, that is your biggest opportunity. So if you think about it, if you're someone that is one of our typical customers, your revenue comes from your production and what you make. So anything that you have that can improve the quality of that production, increase the amount of it, decrease the cost of it, decrease energy, those are typically the biggest profit levers that those people have that are in the manufacturing space to apply analytics to. There's different types and technologies of, of analytics. You know, we touched on this a little bit this morning in the conversation that Lyle Stewart and I had. In our industries, I think the more traditional type that people are used to that really started with uh, the design of facilities are principles driven kind of analytics. When you know what's going on from a thermodynamics, a chemistry, you know, you know the mechanisms of what's happening. Sometimes I've heard people call these mechanistic you know, models in terms of knowing how things actually are transpiring from a first principles basis that you can build a model and then run the current situation you're in against that model. Plants are designed this way, as I said. We have wonderful, very sophisticated tools that embed a lot of that technology. Also, on the principal side are more rule-based models where we know things that when this goes wrong, it generates this kind of a symptom, right? No wear in a tire generates a flat tire, okay? Pretty straightforward to figure out. And that's also used a lot and has been used a lot in the reliability space in the form of what's called an FMEA, or a failure mode effects analysis, and you'll, you'll hear us talk about that. The other side is the data-driven type of analytics, where you're going to build a model or predict a behavior largely from statistical analysis of the data without knowing the actual mechanisms or physics about what's going on. That's not new. Probably many of us, if not most of us in this room, took a uh, statistics course one time and learned things like linear regression and other things to help you do that. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit later about many of the places in our portfolio where we've put these data-driven models. But it's the advancements in these technologies and the advancements in the compute horsepower that's really driven a lot of the, the recent kind of excitement about analytics and the idea that it can be much simpler you know, to take a complex problem and train a model based on these data-driven mechanisms, machine learning, deep learning, all these new techniques that basically are enhanced pattern recognition kind of technology. So you go from you know, having to train or teach something how, how it works based on the basic rules to letting it just figure out what the associations are through mathematical correlations. Now, let's look at where the benefits come in and the way a typical plant is arranged. Obviously, plants are very complex systems. And like every complex systems, 
it's built up from a number of less complex systems, right? At the very lowest level, you have components, okay, whether it's piping or maybe a valve going to an asset or what's called a full asset, like a pump or a heat exchanger, to a complete process unit, to an entire plant. And then if you're a large manufacturer, you'll have a fleet of plants. And one of the first things you want to do is decide, well, where is the business opportunity? Let's prioritize, you know, what the point in this is that we can most affect and will deliver the best business result. And then when we look at what actual technology and what, how we apply analytics to that, what you'll find is when you, when you go down lower in that set of stuff, we actually have a lot of very good principle-driven analytics and FMEAs that we already know that can be applied to these lower level, simpler kind of assets before they're brought up into a more complex asset like a process unit. When you step back and try to look at maybe an entire facility, that's when you're gonna to wanna to start to use some of the machine learning type technology and some of the uh, techniques that are going to look at multiple process units all together where you may not have a model for all of this, okay? Or you may have a model that was done originally when the plant was first designed, but maybe running under very different operating conditions, different raw materials, very different things than what that original first principles model was set up for. And even once you have the technology, another very key part is getting the output of those analytics to the person who's going to take the action. Because we talk in like that circle that Stuart showed you, we talk all the time, you know, we call that the see, decide, act. And as I always say, if you're not gonna do the act, why are you doing the seeing and deciding, okay? If you're going to pull out your phone, check the traffic from here to the airport, and then ignore what it tells you and not change your route when it says there's a traffic jam between here and the way you intended to go, don't bother. Don't bother checking in the first place, right? So all of this comes down to connecting to people who actually can do something, can improve the situation, and actually act on whatever the output of the analytics might be. Another uh, way of, or another topic here to think of is, okay, the principles-based analytics, the data-driven type analytics, okay, why use which where and what's the, what's the difference? Well, we actually have, if we look at equipment, for instance, and equipment reliability, we have through many, many years of consulting uh, contracts and working with end users on reliability studies, we've got over 6,200 equipment templates here with nearly 500 failure mode and effects analysis models built for a lot of the common assets. And if you look at these different asset classes, what you're seeing in this chart is the dark green in each category is given the appropriate instrumentation, the percentages of failure we could determine ahead of time through these FMEA models by having that kind of data. And it basically comes out to nearly 80% for these equipment classes that with the right instrumentation and measurements, we could determine ahead of time with FMEAs, with actual first principle models, instead of needing you know, to, to jump to a statistical or a data-driven model, we have a very certain model here in FMEA that knows exactly how things are interacted. You know, my, my joke in all of this all the time is, you know, the third time your car runs out of gas, machine learning will figure out that cars need gas to run. Okay, that's, and that's how it is, right? They, they learn looking at data sets and looking at history and the history of what's transpired before and then try to predict from a pattern matching what's gonna happen now. If you have some of these first principle based uh, data and models, I think it's always best to start with those and then bring the machine learning in to fill in the gaps. Another question that comes up a lot is, okay, should we do these models ourselves or should we take a model that somebody's already done? Okay, we asked some customers that. We did as part of our survey, and you can see the results here, where three quarters of the folks that were working on digital transformation said, you know, it's okay to just use, or we'd prefer to use packaged analytics, something where somebody's already solved the problem for a particular 
processor equipment class than to go in and recreate our own solution from scratch, okay? Now, sometimes you run into what I call the, the equal and opposite engineer problem, okay, where engineers like to invent things. And some, any solution that another engineer has come up with may not be the, you know, is not gonna necessarily be the one they wanna use. But if you step back and look at this, really, if we've done this already, if we have a solution for, you know, a known answer to a known problem, as we call it, that's probably the best solution for most customers rather than starting with an open analytics toolkit and, and, and trying to apply data to it and figure out their own models. Then you can see, you know, just from a competency map, how that lines up. And of course, you hear a lot about data scientists, data scientists, data scientists, and the idea that you need data scientists to build these particular models, especially the data-driven models. What has, I think, been proven to true over the last couple of years is that you really still need someone with the domain expertise and knowledge about the application, not just a pure data scientist. And an engineer, you know, is probably best suited to use one of the CAN models. When you put them with a data scientist, then you can have the combination of both guys that can build uh, the more complex models that you need. We have a lot of experience in this space. We have a lot of experience because we started at the bottom of that triangle that you see on the side. We started with doing analytics and diagnostics in our own field devices, you know, way back in the 80s, okay? And we continued to do more analytics stuff at the field level, especially around rotating equipment health, vibration, vibration analysis. We have a number of patents on vibration analysis and, and the spectral analysis that goes with that. Uh, we then rolled out a number of canned equipment class specific applications, our, our inside applications as we called them. In Delta V, we had advanced process control. Advanced process control basically uses a data derived model, right? You do a step change on a process, you build a model out of the response that happens, you do control against that. And then we also added things like fuzzy logic and neural nets embedded inside of our distributed control system back in the 90s we were using these technologies. Lately, we've upped our game quite a bit by moving more into the simulation digital twin space with some acquisitions that we've made, whether it's, you know, Mina and their Mimic product, you know, for process simulation or reservoir models with the paradigm acquisition we did. So we've really grown our capability in the big kind of uh, plant level or reservoir level modeling capability. And then most recently, we kind of filled what I would say was maybe the, the one gap we still had, which was a generic toolbox and platform for doing overall analytics, machine learning, AI type applications at, the, at that highest level of the triangle of looking at either a complete large process unit or an entire plant facility uh, with KNET. Now having that technology is great, but there's still the challenge of getting the data to the technology. So the data management and integration, and there we did an, an acquisition recently of a company called iSolutions that specializes in connecting data together, DCSs with historians, with cloud, with ERP systems, whatever it may be. There's the challenge of getting the response or the analysis to the right person that can take the action. That's where we came out with our plant web optics platform uh, about four years ago. Okay, and we've been building on that steadily as a place to take the results of those analytics and make them actioned by getting that to the right person at the right time on whatever tool they need. And then some services and consultants to put all of that together for you. And that's our operational certainty consulting Team. So if we look at analytics and we look at the chart that Stuart showed you, that plant web digital ecosystem chart that we use a lot, you know, you can see the technologies we have now together with the consulting and other capability. Go back to this chart for a minute because, okay, we have this green part, we have all this great technology, but we still need to get those data to the right people. We still need to actionalize it. We also need to 
figure out how to scale it. Everybody expects, as we discussed this morning on stage, big numbers from digital transformation and big uh, business gains. How do you get there? Okay, how do you actually have a sustainable program that results in rolling up into those big numbers? As Stuart said, the Big Bang, you know, is pretty tough. You know, I, it's like, you know, I used the analogy this morning. It's kind of like trying to remodel every room in your house while you're living in your house, okay? Rather than figuring out a, a way to, you know, stepwise do that with a vision of what the whole thing will look like when you're done. So if we look at a typical organization here, just, you know, you have a number of facilities, you have a, an overall corporation IT or maybe corporate engineering kind of team looking at things. Well, what we find is that the corporate level folks tend to work on the vision and strategy. They're very good at defining standards. You may actually have corporate level teams, you know, uh, chief digital officer put in place or a center of practice, those kinds of organizations specifically to drive transformations across an entire corporation. And hopefully they're allocating some money to drive digital transformation, okay? So they're doing a lot of good stuff to get things going, but if the business units, if the folks that actually have to adopt the practices are not involved, not on board with what's happening there, well, it's not likely to happen, okay? You may be shocked, but I've noticed that sometimes people in plants don't always automatically do everything that their corporate organization tells them to do. I know that's a shocking revelation, but that, you know, it takes sometimes to get them on board and get them convinced that this is the rest, the right idea or the best thing to do. So the guys down in the plants, they're not sitting still though in this space either, right? Because they've got problems to solve every day. So they have smart, motivated personnel that are looking at new technology, figuring out new ways to solve these problems. They're grabbing this technology, using it to solve problems, achieving ROI at the plant level. By definition, typically, if it's happening at the plant, it's happening with the people that are responsible for it to happen. So the workflow issue is more manageable. I won't say completely manageable, because not everybody always agrees inside the plant as well that this is the, the new and better way. Okay, and of course, they're gonna do it in such a way that it works with their install base of technology, okay? So the plants, you know, are the ones that can bring the business problems that need to be solved, but without a connection to an overall corporate strategy, well, they're gonna deliver results just at that plant level. Because what they're not good at is, and what they're not responsible for is figuring out how to take that solution, that technology, and replicate it across an entire fleet, okay? So you need both organizations here. You need the vision and the corporate strategy and the programmatic approach that a corporate level organization can bring who's willing to go work with the plants, steal great ideas from the plants, bring those up, and turn them into a programmatic thing to deliver results. Let's look at how this could happen and an example of how this could roll out, okay? So let's say someone at the plant comes up with a great idea, okay? And they implement that application and they save and generate some small amount of savings, okay? Well, what you want to have happen then is that the corporate guys recognize that and put that into that reproducible library and the programmatic approach that they might have, okay? So that as that same plant develops another application, they're building up a portfolio of these best practices and things to do. And then maybe driven by the corporate level organization, it gets pushed down to other sites as a best practice now. And because you have a reference site that you can point the other guys to, it's much easier to talk them into this being a good way to change the work practice. Because if you think, think of your own personal life, how do you adopt a new digital practice? What's one of the, the core things you do, 
you talk to a friend or relative and say, hey, did you try this new app? You know, did, did, did it work for you? You know, did you ever try, you know, buying whatever it may be? Have you, you know, did you try Uber? Did it work for you? Did you try, you know, ordering your groceries and have them delivered at home? You know, how was the experience, right? Well, the same thing is true here, right? The, nothing is better than having people who actually are going to implement something and live with the results be an advocate for it. So keep going. You get more of those applications replicated in sites. You roll them out then to n number in sites. And pretty soon, what you've done is one room at a time, you've remodeled all the houses, OK, while they're still living in them and while they're still operating. Here's a very specific example with someone that we've actually worked with, OK? And this is a, a refining example. In this particular case, the example that they rolled out at first was actually steam trap monitoring. And the steam trap monitoring solution was important to them because they lived in a place of very high energy costs. And they derived quite a bit of value just from the energy savings that came from the steam trap solution that we provided with them. Corporate learned about this solution, learned about the architecture and, and how they did this in such a way that it would be secure. And corporate said, you know, that technology and the approach you used, not everybody is interested in steam traps, but everybody's got heat exchangers. And we can use that exact same model for heat exchangers. So let's use the same architecture approach that you did with the steam traps for heat exchangers, OK? Then they said, OK, now our job is to build an infrastructure that everybody could use across all the plants so that we can roll this solution out across all of our facilities. So they built a cloud-based architecture. They actually moved it into their own kind of cloud-based architecture from which they intended to roll it out across all their facilities. And then, of course, the next step is push that down to each and every facility, and then the total numbers become large. So when it comes to digital transformation in general, this is a chart you have seen from us before. You know, our philosophy and what we've said always is that you need to start with the business outcomes and the business problem, not the technology. OK, let the problem you solve drive the technology needs to be scalable, like we just described. The, the Big Bang approach is hard, if not impossible, for people to bite off on and fund all at one time. I think it, it, it relies too much on a, on a trust me that the outcome will come kind of basis. And getting the people and the work practices involved is as important, if not more important, than rolling out the new digital technology. And that is the approach that we will be following and continue to follow in the analytics space. With that, I'd like to have you hear from somebody who actually does this. So it's, it's much better than listening to me talk about it theoretically. I'd like to introduce Rob Sense, who's going to come up and talk to you about 3M and their digital journey. Rob? Yep. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Peter said, I'm Rob Sense with 3M Company um, out of Minnesota. I work and reside out of the Cottage Grove, Minnesota plant site, which is in the, the suburbs of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I'm in a, the Film and Material Resource Division, or FMRD, of 3M Company, which is uh, where our own internal specialty chemical and adhesives supplier for 3M Corporation. Innovation is very um, an integral part of our company in our culture. There are over 100,000 different product SKUs in it that we make. Um, you may recognize many of these different brand names that I have up here on the slides. There are over 230 different manufacturing locations across the globe. And I support, within FMRD, the five different manufacturing sites of our division. When we're looking to our future, we're looking to head towards a perfect storm. Aging equipment from uh, plants that have been around for a little bit, um, less experienced workforce for a lot of different reasons, and EHS sustainability pressure to drive excellence across the globe. 
all with increasing demands for production. Our Factory of the Future initiatives, we're looking at different ways that we can use technology to help fill some of these gaps. 3M Corporate Executive Management created a program called Pacesetter to help drive a common approach to solve these problems across all of our manufacturing sites. Pacesetter is an acronym. We engineers, you know, we, we love them. <laughs> um, P, proprietary process technology. A is for automated, no-touch processing. C, connected, data-driven processing. Efficiency, lean, continuous process improvement. And lastly, safe and sustainable, driving environmental stewardship across the globe. We are using this program to drive quality, service, and value to all of our customers. The expected benefits of driving from these programs is to really drive us to that top quartile performance for the corporation. It is very difficult to just dive right into a digital transformation. It is impossible to do the things on the right without having your foundations on the left solid and robust. To start your journey, really step one is assessment of what you have today and where do you want to go in the future. In other words, a roadmap. Then you need to build your foundation. You need to get the, the things solid and robust so that you can add the technologies that are much more advanced. You need to define the problems that you want to solve and then implement those technologies. But of these, that foundation is extremely critical if you want to be successful with your digital transformation. We, within FMRD, we chose for our journey four different key technologies to solve problems in our manufacturing. Across the corporation, other divisions had other solutions, other problems, other things that they wanted to solve. But for us in FMRD, our key initiatives were batch automation and advanced control programming. This is key for operations, safety, and productivity. Our second initiative was process analytical technologies, or PAT technologies, for real-time process analysis of our chemistries and our, our processing. We can do this without, with, by eliminating samples and steering and controlling a process. Our third initiative was around workflow. And workflow, this is around operator-guided work experience, or standard work. An operator that has 20 months experience does the exact same thing that an operator that has 20 years experience. Standard work. And our fourth initiative was really around reliability and analytics so we can extend the life of our equipment. <clears throat> How we executed this is we ended up piloting different technologies. We wanted to prove that it works and get what we call, get wins. It's much easier to sell to management if you have some wins that tell them that this technology works and we see some real benefits. Once you do get prove that it works, we look to expand our technology. We went to other units, other areas within a site, or different plant sites across the country and across the globe. No one of my plants had all the resources to try all of these technologies at one time. So I, I was able to and had to work with different people in these different plants to pilot these different technologies. I chose the people based a lot on, on their interest, their expertise available, and if they had a problem that they wanted to try to solve. Some of the benefits that we've, we've seen to date, um, we are supporting increased production volume. We have, um, with less experienced operations, we're running safely and keeping productivity. Um, even though many of the experienced operators have changed positions or retired, moved on. Um, our reliability program is starting to predict the health of assets before catastrophic failures occur. And we are supporting 
some key new specialized processes that have come online where the health of the equipment is critical for us to be able to continue to make this process. In summary, the perfect storm that we saw was real for us. We had to live, we've been living through that. 3M corporate pay setter initiative is driving a common approach to implementing these technologies across our corporation. The assessment and building the foundation and defining the roadmap are critical first steps as you want to go forward with your digital transformation. Tracking progress and getting wins is also critical as you start going to management to ask for additional funds. As part of our digital transformation, we have aligned with corporate teams for resources and analysis internally, but we've also partnered with key suppliers here, like Emerson, to implement many of our key technologies. Thank you. Appreciate it. So now I'd like to introduce Greg Aguilar. Greg's going to talk to you about Selenese's experiences with analytics. Thanks, Greg. Good afternoon. So my name is Greg Aguilar. I'm a global reliability engineer with Selenese Chemicals based out of Houston. I work in our corporate reliability plant supporting about 45 sites globally. So at Selenese, we're a technology and specialty material company with leading businesses in key regions across the globe. Our hope is to create value for our customers through partnerships that offer innovative solutions while improving the world. And at Selenese, our digital transformation journey started about a year and a half ago. We determined early on that we needed to identify a partner to make this journey with. However, we first needed to identify a problem to solve. And so how many of us walk into an office like this? I see some recognition. And so, probably more than we'd like to admit, but how many think a desk like this is a problem? Because there is a problem here, but it's not necessarily all the papers scattered about. More of an issue is the stranded knowledge, information, and data that resides in those papers and documents. Because how can we expect to make high quality decisions without all the information available to make that decision upon? when all that information is siloed away in someone's office, likely to be forgotten about. So we started with the problem, and that problem is having that siloed, stranded, forgotten knowledge. But we need to couple that with the business case. And so when brainstorming with internal experts, we came up with these three common buckets to sort them into. There were predictive maintenance, process optimization, and energy management. With these, we could take the stranded knowledge we showed before, data from our process historians, and tribal knowledge, and codify it in models that would allow us to increase our productivity and uptime while reducing cost. And so we identified 54 potential use cases whenever we went out and investigated. We ranked them across several criteria and prioritized them based on impact to the business and feasibility of implementation. From there, a cross-functional team of company experts narrowed our list down to a final selection of two to take to pilot, a predictive maintenance use case and a process optimization example. All right, so after narrowing that list down, we had identified the problem we were trying to solve and we had coupled it with the business case. So now we need to identify a partner. But the landscape was vast. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only growing every year. And so with all these options, how did we choose? So we did a deep dive of 43 vendors in the industrial IoT space. The solutions offered ranged from data warehouse type applications with analytics as an add-on uh, to standard analytic tools or, or single purpose equipment diagnostics. But really we wanted something in the middle. We wanted an analytics platform that could be deployed on-premises and capture knowledge from various data sources. In the process, we approached mature, well-established companies, and we also approached smaller, more flexible startups. 
So at the end of the day, we narrowed that list of 43 down to 12, and we started solutioning with those 12. From those 12, we narrowed the field further to six, to two, and to one. And so in Emerson, we found a partner with an analytics platform that met our requirements, but also a company that possessed a level of reliability expertise that wasn't common in the field of candidates we investigated. And so how did it turn out? We'll show an example. So here is an example of a finding that was identified by the solution we developed together. What we're looking at is lube oil temperature on a rotating piece of equipment. So if you, uh, it's over a two week period, nothing looks out of the ordinary. It's relatively flat. We're well below our high level alarm, but the system identified this as an issue and drove us to go and investigate. But everything looked good, so let's zoom out a bit. If we look at a two month trend, Still, we're below our high alarm limit. We see the regular fluctuations of day-to-day -day ambient temperature. But again, everything looks good, and still the system alerted us. So now let's zoom out one more time. So here we're looking at two years, and here you can see the shift that the system had identified. Through statistical analysis and analytics, it identified that change from our historical level and alerted us so that we could go out and begin investigating. And so after we investigated, this is what we found. The lube oil we had installed the lube oil heater to remove moisture from the, content, from the lube oil. Unfortunately, a control valve in the loop had gotten stuck, and so it wasn't allowing the cooler to perform its function, and the lube oil wasn't returning to historical levels. But because this occurred over a period of time, Nobody noticed it when looking at the data on a day-to-day -day or even week-to-week -week basis. It wasn't until we, the system had identified that and we were able to take a longer view look at it and go out and troubleshoot it that we identified uh, that that piece of equipment had failed. And so, and it had gone unnoticed for months um, before, before the system had picked it up. And if it had continued to rise unnoticed, it could have led to long-term damage of the equipment and potential shutdown of our unit. But we live in, with the restraints of an operating unit. We weren't able to shut it down to replace that valve, but we were able to make a data-driven decision to add it to our turnaround scope and also uh, to put instructions in place so that if the temperature did continue to rise, we could go out there and bypass the valve to put cooling onto the system. But an interesting thing happened here on the right. About a month ago, you can see that the valve actually became unstuck and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. And so whenever it dropped, that validated our concern with the valve and proved that the technology could identify hidden failures. But just as important as avoiding lost production or increased maintenance costs, success like this built confidence in the technology so that we're no longer pushing this application from corporate down to the sites. Now they're pulling it from us and asking where else we can install this on more critical pieces of equipment. And as we implement the new use cases, we can roll them out to new sites with minimal effort. We could take advantage of the knowledge already codified in the model and leverage learnings that take place at other locations as we transfer that knowledge to new sites. In this way, we're building institutional knowledge and spreading it across the company. By starting with a known successful use case, it gives us a launching point for the sites to innovate and develop their own applications and their own learnings. So in that way, the technological value accelerates the institutional knowledge compounds, and we create a data-driven culture for making decisions. Thank you. The Emerson uh, CEO, a gentleman by the name of David Farr, familiar to many of the Emerson folks here, always likes to tell us when he's giving us presentations that when we see the same chart more than once, it's an important chart, and we should pay attention. I know the Emerson folks, I'm sure, remember that, right? So showing you this uh, chart, not for the first time in the Emerson history here, 
you know, we believe that we are the right uh, folks as a partner for our customers on digital transformation. And I think you heard some of that in the customer presentations we just heard, not just because of the technology, which we love to talk about, and we have tons of, and I'm the technology guy, I like talking about technology, but because of the domain expertise that we bring and that we try to embed in our technology as well to save work and make the technology more applicable more quickly for our customers and our ability to work with them on developing a roadmap. So helping them prioritize what they need to do when they're going to do it. So with that, I'd like to invite Rob and Greg to come back up. We're gonna have a little bit of a Q&A. Um, I was just wondering if there was any specific examples of the technology that 3M implemented, um, you know, from so, Emerson or so we've to achieve what you did. Yep, we have uh, implemented uh, around the reliability piece. Um, we've the health advisor, performance advisor for predictive analytics. We're online vibration monitoring the 6500s with the condition-based monitoring systems. Um, obviously, we're, we use a lot of Delta V control systems, so the batch automation, um, advanced control, um, whether we do implement that internally or with uh, external resources, um, Emerson or the, the impact partners. Um, so we implement, and um, also, I guess, a lot of even the wired vibration. So the vibration technologies have been pretty key for us over the last uh, 18 months to two years. Uh, Matt Littlefield, LNS. Uh, for Greg, a, a couple questions for you. Uh, you know, one of the things we've seen on some of the data-driven approaches to uh, predictive maintenance is that, yeah, the data-driven approach finds the problem, but you might have found it anyways with your traditional time-based approach. So did you get any feedback like that? Uh, also, knowing that a failure is more likely is one piece, but then you have to take some type of action. It sounds like you decided exactly. not to take action at that point in time. So how, what other systems, or how did you make that decision? Like, what other systems did you have to go to for that? Okay, good question. So the particular failure that we had identified, uh, as you saw in the two-year trend, had been in place for nine months after we added a, a vacuum dehydrator to the system to remove the moisture content. Um, it, it wasn't seen as a degraded system at the time by, by our machinery engineer. Um, and to be honest, it was actually two types of alerts that were generated. One was the, the principle-driven FMEA alert that notified us on the actual cooling system being the problem. The other one was the data-driven linear regression model that identified, zeroed in on uh, the, the potential damage to our bearings because of it. Um, and so that particular failure if that, that particular valve that failed was not in the scope to be replaced or inspected. It, it, it was not considered an issue uh, until the system identified it. We went out there, troubleshot, uh, felt that the cooling was not working adequately, narrowed it down to that device and put it into the scope to, to be replaced. What you're saying about being able to take action at the time, you're right. We, we operate our units for 100% uptime and reliability. We don't want to take an outage unless absolutely necessary. And so that goes back to making data-driven approaches with the most information available at the time. And so because we now understood the condition of our assets, we could analyze the risk and determine if it was necessary to bring the unit down or to put a mitigation in plan in order to, to minimize that risk to an acceptable level. And so that's what we did. We put the plan in place to remove it at the next turnaround, which was uh, six months later. But we also put it operating instructions in place so that if that temperature continued to rise, which we were now monitoring, then we could go out there and fully bypass that valve so that we could apply 100% cooling. Yes, it's inefficient, and it would impact the, the operation of the compressor a bit, but it, we wouldn't trip the unit which has a much bigger impact. And so it's just having that information available to be able to make those data-driven decisions. Can you maybe talk about the benefits you're reaping so far? I mean, how, how that's comparing to kind of what you expected? 
and then maybe talk about you know where you are in terms of you know proving out the thesis versus now going full bore. Have you got corporate buy-in to kind of really expand this to the 240 plants across 3M? Where are you in that process? So we have had successful pilots um, for all these different technologies in one plant. We're in the process of replicating. We've expanded either within a given area or we're, we're replicating technologies in all of our plants now. Um, it might be almost a, a pilot bringing that technology into the plant because one of the biggest challenges is the culture change, bringing in these new tools, these new technologies into the plant, and they need to understand it. So even though we piloted it in one plant and we proved that it worked, we're still bringing it a small, pilot, almost another pilot into each plant, but we've been able to sell that to management, understanding that there are benefits received. And so yeah, we, we do track that internally, um, some of the wins and the, the benefits that we're seeing, and uh, we use that to help um, when we ask for additional funding. Maybe a follow on as well. Um, so as you went from 43 down to 12, down to six, <laughs> down to whatever it was, when you got down to the final, say six, were they all sort of Emerson type providers? Not at all. So you, were, you, you still had some startups and so sort of, okay. Yeah, we still had some larger companies. We still had some startups, it was a mix. Uh, and when investigating the space, we found there was no consensus on the right approach. Or, or the right um, even value proposition that the vendors were providing. Uh, and, and so there were several different factors. I believe for the vendors, uh, we had 27 different criteria that we ranked them all on. Um, and it, it covered their uh, internal competency around analytics, the capabilities of their technology, the cost, the, the ability to scale. Um, and, and so, Every vendor had um, different pros and cons they were bringing to it, but it, it was a, a broad group. Can you uh, speak a little more to uh, the details around bringing people in the plants to be involved with these technologies? I know, uh, Robert, you mentioned the, the pace setter program you have. Can you talk about how the workers, the operators in the plant were brought into that? And also, Greg, I know you showed the great data that the analytics show, but how did you get the buy-in and the instantiation among the operators to take it to the next level? So from, from our perspective, the, the Pace Setter program was really the corporate initiative, and that, that brought corporate resources and from a technology, corporate engineering, and executive level management. So understanding that, but as we looked at what the, the four initiatives, that's when we started looking at each plant or in our case, our division, and what problems do we need to solve? And within our division, we picked those four. From that, as we started going into the details of what, do we, what are we trying to solve, um, we would get the operations involved with um, dojo type workshops or um, interviewing or actually going out and seeing what their work practices are and understanding what they do on a day to day. So, some of these workflow, for instance, is a, a potential to really change their daily work practice. Um, reliability helps plant engineering and the maintenance side of it. So when we're changing work practices, we, ha we have to get them their buy-in very early. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to, to continue to grow that. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And so in our experience, we, the 54 use cases we came up with were developed with input from the individuals in the units and the sites to address specific pain points that they felt on a day-to-day -day basis so that they um, had some buy-in into to what we were developing. Uh, in addition, we included them every step of the way from um, initially brainstorming what the issue was to identifying um, even who the, the solution provider would be and uh, going through and identifying the rules and the, the, the FMEA models and bringing their expertise in, trying to make them feel like they were, because they are uh, value-added partners in the whole process. And, and then bringing them in on the workflow piece and, and trying to understand how they work day to day and how this would fit into their existing workflow is a constant collaboration with the units. 
At the same time, culture changes are difficult. And, and the successes we've seen has helped a lot in really um, enabling them in to, to grab hold of the technology and use it. But it, it's still an ongoing battle because people um, find change difficult and, yes. and new ways of doing things can be hard. You're both talking about reliability and you're talking about reliability in terms of maintenance. Is that the focus of your reliability work or is it a more inclusive endeavor? For, for our, from our perspective, we are looking at the reliability of the equipment from a plant engineering, but also the, the, the process, the performance of the process. So looking at how a heat exchanger is performing, for instance, or looking at the effic overall efficiency of the process. So I, I would say it's more the, the base level plant engineering equipment reliability is the foundation behind it, but we want to tie that and bring that to the process. Yeah, agreed. We're taking a similar approach. The example I showed was a predictive maintenance uh, use case, so it was focused on equipment reliability. Uh, but the other pilot that, that we're working right now is really focused on the process and much more complex and broad in scale. We can't really go into detail of what it's covering, but we expect it to be a game changer within uh, this operating are you, unit. Are your operators empowered to make changes to, to the, how they're operating if they do detect a problem so you can at least get through whatever you're making or processing at the moment? The, the power to make changes varies it, a lot. That, I would say, holistically, probably not, depending. It depends on what, what the issue is and where they are but there are, might be safety ramifications or other things that they need to be aware of. Okay. And, and similar, so it, I consider this a tool to augment the, the ability of our operators and our technicians to, to more effectively do their job. It, it's not about, well, at least in this case, it's not about taking work out or removing someone's job. It's about freeing up their time to be able to do more value-added tasks. Yes. Because we have this system that's able to automate some of those um, tasks. That, that, so for instance, the signal that we looked at in that particular model, we were looking at 80 different variables. 80 variables for one piece of equipment is too much for any single individual to monitor. We have an engineer who was trying to do that. And so putting a system like this in place frees them up to really go after more highly yeah. uh, high value. Tasks. Yeah, and I would say we said this, we're, we want the operators to add value to the products. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, make, that, make them more efficient, make them add value versus add, doing non-value work. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you, you mentioned in your plants that you guys had different pilots in different plants. And I'm really curious what kind of uh, advice you might give other people about picking where a pilot goes and who, especially if you're trying to do something across the board, how do you pick who gets what pilots or? For, my experience has been really about what, what problems are there that are in the plant, or what are you trying to solve? But then what kind of experience, a lot of these pilots, I'm trying to do them within existing resources, within the people that are already in the plants. So the people that have the knowledge to use the technology, um, they have time. They're you know, I, I, it's a sell. I, I have to work with them to accept the technologies. But I, I really look to see if they have a problem that I'm trying to that I can solve with this, and if they have the ability and the time to work on a pilot. And, and to add on to that, in particular with the KNet application, you also need the data. They're they're not necessarily. Um, all the, the sensors coming in and the information coming in that you need. So uh, we try to focus on equipment that had uh, repeat failure issues or chronic reliability issues, but we're also instrumented enough to, to really make full use of it. Though, uh, with the power of the system and, and kind of the FMEA approach that it takes, you can still get a lot of value out of it with not a necessarily completely instrumented piece of equipment. Um, can you talk about the role of IT, um, like from where you were and where you are currently, like uh, selecting the use cases or implementing, and then what's the vision of how IT will play a role in scaling this across 30, 40, 50 plants globally? From, from my perspective, when I, the, the foundational roadmap, um, the network and the security are really a couple of the key foundational pieces that are needed. So 
bringing the technology to the plant floor, but getting the data, moving it. IT has to be a part of that. That is sometimes a challenge, especially as we're bringing in new technologies, whether it be wireless tablets or you know, something that's new for them. Um, the concept of an OT organization for us is relatively new. There are a handful of people that are starting to transition to that OT, and we need to leverage them because the, the IT people are there to protect the corporation, and sometimes the next best technology, it can be a challenge. And that, so working with them early is critical as you're starting to understand what type of technology are coming in, because they can, they can be very helpful or they can uh, yeah. slow progress. Yeah, no, collaboration with IT is a must now because the, the whole IT, OT convergence is happening and um, the technology that's in the units today is much more advanced and, and really has an IT component to it that uh, needs to be well understood and there needs to be that collaboration so that we're not just installing things in our units without any real security or understanding of how it might impact other systems. There needs to be that collaboration between the two groups. Um, so, so maybe two years ago I wasn't uh, really great friends with our IT department, whereas now um, now people think I work for our IT department. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, exactly. What's the expression? Necessity makes strange bedfellows yeah, or something exactly. like that? Yes, right? that, so. that is very much true. <laughs> um, I don't want to take attention away from the, the use cases, but I have a vocabulary question. Peter, you talked about four kinds of analytics. Does that correspond to four types of models? And do those models taken together culminate in a digital twin? So the, the light's blasting me in the face here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, there. Oh, I know it was Paul. I could, I could like, where is he? Okay. <laughs> I recognize his voice. I think when you, okay, that's a whole other discussion we can have when we talk about digital twin because, um, you know, digital twin to me, if it's going to be a comprehensive one, means all aspects of a particular asset or whatever it is. So there could be a process-based digital twin, for instance, that could be first principles based because you have a, a robust thermodynamic and chemical model that's going on. There could be a reliability aspect of that, which could be more a mixture of both with the FMEA and the and the data derived models, like you you know you heard Greg talk about. Okay, then there's you know those are kind of maybe the two cornerstones, but then there's also the 3D visualization of the 3D geospatial model that you want to link into that that you would use for AR, VR applications, or we do a thing now in our uh, operator training where we link uh, a virtual reality 3D spatial model with both the process and control system simulation so that you can do both the boardroom operator and the field operator can work through a startup procedure and they're both doing their part of it from a simulation, so, that's a, so that geospatial model is a third component. That one's kind of neither of the above, right? That's an actual, uh, I don't know what I would call that one, that's data of how the geospatial part is arranged. And then there's all the actual work practices that go around that and the safety part of those work practices and trying to model all of those to keep people inside the envelope, I think, as you guys were talking about what the operators can change. So uh, to me, it, again, it depends on what you're trying to do you know, with the model, what, you know, the benefit you're looking for, which of these technologies works out the best. And the vision is that eventually you would build all these dimensions, you know, and have a complete digital twin of the whole facility. You know, I, I, a lot of times I think about it as, okay, you know, your doctor has a digital twin of you that he looks at you through one way that has to do with all your health and medical benefits. Your lawyer has one that has to do with what your legal set, you know, your, your financial person has another one. To get a complete picture of you, you need all of those to come together and there's a lot of overlap in some of that data. And everybody's, I think, striving to try to get to that now where they have that wall-to-wall -wall picture but meanwhile, we're using the ones to meet very specific applications like these guys just talked about. This is for specifically for Greg, but also for you, Rob. Can you give us an idea of the, the scale of the implementation and, and maybe what the, the timeline even was for 
getting to where you where you are now and and if you can talk about in the future how far that implementation is expected to go across the entire organization so the initial journey from start to where we are now has been about a year and a half um, it, it, we took about six months to identify uh, the use cases and, and who to partner with and about another six months for each use case uh, piloting them um, like I said we had 54 different potential use cases um, across 45 sites we try to identify the ones that are most leverageable where we could transfer that knowledge across multiple sites so as we get it installed in one place it's easily movable to another so we could accelerate that scale um, so over a five-year period we hope to, to have the majority of our organization with some sort of model developed or implemented at the site and I would say for us, we also we do have a, a vision and a roadmap of where and how we want to deploy these technologies as we go from pilot to full-scale production and, and scale up. Some of these technologies fit are very defined for us in our chemical manufacturing areas. There are some of these technologies that we're using, especially in the reliability space, where looking at corporate reliability engineering groups um, how do they, you know, can these also go across the rest of the corporation? Because we have lots of other pumps and extruders and other mechanical equipment across the corporation. I'm just wondering, you know, people have been doing operational performance improvement for many decades. They've had partners helping them do that. Um, so my question is, how is what you're doing now and the tools you're using more digitally transformy than what you did like a couple of years ago? You know, what makes the stuff now part of digital transformation? For us, there, there's kind of two parts. One is from a, just the whole program, the fact that I've been working on technologies for decades, but the fact that the technology and now the executive level management and having interest in the program. So driving it from that perspective, that's part of the transformation. I think the other part is the fact that the data is becoming much more accessible in, in our case. It's not the, the desk full of the papers like in Greg's, Greg's presentation. Um, we had a lot of those islands of data and a lot of tribal knowledge that was available that people had. Now we're trying to make that all, it's, it's much more cohesive and it's in areas where um, whether it's an experienced engineer, a brand new engineer, or a, a, an operator, that data is accessible so that they can make that best decision in the most timely manner. See, and I agree with that. To add to that, I, I feel like it is part of this, the whole ITOT collaboration. And, and when you have wireless and even Wi-Fi infrastructures in your unit, that opens up possibilities for mobile worker applications or um, just other ways to, to do work that weren't available a few years ago. Yeah, in our case, we have many tablet, our areas are class one, div one, hazardous locations. And just the fact that the, the intrinsically safe tablets, Windows tablets, that technology is about two years old. Yeah. So just the fact that some of this emerging technology is allowing us to use more tools. The mobility was kind of the first thing my head went to because it's very different having service guys out there without any ability to get to any kind of analysis, material safety data sheet, any you know, any kind of collaboration with somebody. That is, that's a big plus. Yep. Sure. I'm uh, I'm asking on on behalf of Lal. He said this morning to press you guys on uh, ROI and profitability and. Where are you on the uh, level of return you got going? I, th I think f we, we are tracking that. We're looking at our benefits, um, and so we do track that internally, and we have a, a way to look at that as we extrapolate to replicating across our division. You know, So we are tracking that and looking to, to grow that, but I would say we're, we're still relatively early in our entire journey. Yeah, and that is a struggle. Uh, so for those all, the use cases we identified, we, we had a rough business impact in what the expected ROI was for each one of those. 
um, in the case of the predictive maintenance use case, that quickly showed its value and, and the ability to identify these failures and prevent uh, unit outage or, or even inefficient operation of our equipment. And the process-driven use case, due to the complexity, we're still working through it, really narrowing down what that benefit is. Um, but it's really exciting what we're doing on that side, and so we, we hope to uh, be able to prove that out. Well, I think, thank you very much, both of you. Thanks for taking the time joining us today. Thank you.